said, good morning. Um, Ian Pelta, work for Cummins in Charleston, South Carolina at the Marine Engineering Offices. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is internal combustion, specifically uh, diesel engines. Um, so when I spoke to Paul initially about this seminar, diesel engines is a pretty broad topic. So um, picked a couple things that are of interest. Hopefully they meet your interests. If not, uh, fill out the evaluation form and, and write down things that you're interested in. Um, but what I'm going to cover, um, first of all, is emissions. Emissions is always a topic with, with engines, uh, meeting emissions. Uh, so we're going to look at emissions regulations on engine performance, um, the impact on performance economy, and the packaging. Um, and that will kind of dovetail into power density, duty cycle, and durability of the engines. And then uh, a little bit of a uh, talk on propping, and then we'll, we'll move into maintenance. Uh, I've probably got more material that I know I could cover in 45 minutes. I got kind of a natural stopping point, uh, so I'll get that point. We'll do a time check, uh, do some questions. If you really have a question you want to answer right while I'm going to material, raise a hand and ask it. Um, so impact of emissions regulations. Um, so here in the United States, um, basically we've got two um, emissions bodies that we worry about for marine. That's IMO, International Maritime Organization, and EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. Really, it's the EPA that kind of drives those regulations right now. Um, so as with anything else, um, cars, uh, equipment, things like that, emissions regulations are becoming more and more stringent. And when they do that, uh, engine manufacturers are really forced to redesign our products to meet the emissions. I mean, emissions, if you pick one thing, is really what keeps us engineers up at night. Um, it's, if you don't meet emissions, you're not selling product. You're not selling product, you're not making money. Um, so there's a real strict deadline in hitting these emissions, and, and like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a big worry of ours. But like I said, we must redesign, add systems, or reinvent um, to remain compliant to these EPA emissions. So there have been three EPA um, um, tier changes in the last decade. So right now, currently, we're moving into a tier four. Um, so really, the timeline here, so initially, there was no EPA tier one. There was, was IMO, International Maritime Organization. And then that moved to EPA tier two, I think about 2005 time frame. And what that change really forced was, before that, we had mechanical fuel systems, you know, rotary pumps, inline pumps. So these are Bosch, Nip and Denso, I think pumps, um, systems like that. So you've got injection lines going all the engine, things like that. It's mechanically driven. There really isn't much timing control. Um, these engines, if you remember back, black smoke on acceleration under load. Uh, the high output engines, they would white smoke at idle um, because they just really weren't running efficiently at, at low speeds and low temperatures. Um, so really that IMO to tier two EPA change was really quite good for the industry. It was quite good for me. I was working in service, and I don't know how many black smoke complaints I answered during that time because of mechanical product. We kept pushing and pushing, pushing horsepower, pushing the power levels, and that just increased black smoke. And really, there's not much you can do in a mechanical system to alleviate that. So once we went to tier two electronic control engines, common rail fuel systems, the smoke problems went away, and my job got a whole lot easier. So to me, that was, that was great, going to Tier 2. And then Tier 2 to Tier 3, um, that happened uh, 2012, 2011, 2012, 13, not too long ago. And basically, that's just becoming more and more strict. Um, so a lot of the Tier 2, Tier 3 engines are the same engines. We just made some advancements to the fuel systems, timing, things like that. Um, but it did, what it did do is it challenged some of the older engine designs. So when we moved to tier three engines, some of those engines dropped off the face of the map. Manufacturers didn't offer them anymore. So the market got kind of a little bit smaller. And what we're dealing with right now is tier three to tier four. And that's even more stringent. And what tier four really is gonna drive is uh, after treatment. So you think of your car at home, and for the longest time, automobiles have had catalytic converters to help with emissions. Well, that's what tier four is gonna drive, those type of devices on uh, marine engines. 
So what do we measure for emissions? You know, what does the EPA look for? What are they concerned about? Um, and these are, are four things that get measured for diesel emissions. The first one, uh, nitrogen oxides, commonly called NOxes, N-O-X. So it's a, a nitrogen atom, oxygen atom, and, uh, or a, a multiple of oxygen atoms. Um, this, is, this is the really big one. Um, the cause of, of NOxes is they form at high combustion temperatures. Um, diesel engines like to run a very hot combustion chamber, so you get quite a bit of NOxes. The effects of the NOx is really it, it, it causes ground level ozone and acid rain. Um, and then you look at mitigations, well, you can lower your combustion temperature. Well, that affects your efficiency. The engine isn't as efficient as it once was before. You could do things like exhaust gas recirculation. So another thing that's been used on the automotive side for a period of time, and that's just putting exhaust gas back into the, uh, the intake charge, basically makes the intake charge have less oxygen in it. It burns a little bit cooler and you get less NOxes. Or they got some uh, a new technology called uh, selective catalytic reduction or SCR. We'll talk about that a little bit more. The second thing that we measure is hydrocarbons. And this is the gaseous phase of unburnt fuel, basically. Um, and it's, those are typically at lower temperatures. Um, so now you see, okay, you got, you got emissions that occur at high temperatures, you got emissions that occur at low temperatures. You gotta kinda be somewhere in the middle. Um, they kinda work against each other. Um, the effect is ground level ozone and acid rain, again. It also causes respiratory issues. And the mitigations is higher combustion temperatures. So again, you're trying to find that middle ground um, a diesel oxidation catalyst, which is like a catalyst on your car, or a selective catalytic reduction again. Carbon monoxide, that gets measured. It's really not an issue with diesel engines. Um, it, it's basically incomplete combustion due to a rich fueling condition. So this is really a, a gasoline engine problem. Diesel engines almost always run with excess air, so you never get a rich fuel condition. So. CO levels are naturally very low on, on diesel engines, uh, but we all know the effect of uh, CO, carbon monoxide, um, CO poisoning, depending on uh, the concentration exposure, can lead to death. And then the last one down there, uh, particulate matter. That's uh, solid or, or liquid particles from combustion. And most commonly, that's soot. That's the black, you know, fine substance that collects on the back of transoms. That's particulate matter. Um, the effects are respiratory issues <clears throat> in the mitigation, uh, particulate filters. So there's actually a filter in the exhaust system to collect these, um, these particles. And again, a selective catalytic reduction um, system. So this is the marine EPA regulation schedule. And this is a composite. It combines both commercial and recreational. As you could tell, it's an eye chart. And uh, it's still an eye chart when it's this close to your face. It's, it's, a, it's a complex chart to understand. Um, but really, it just kind of lays out um, where the emissions changes are occurring. Um, so let me get the laser going here. Uh, so the green is tier two. Uh, the blue is tier three. And the yellow is tier four. Along the top, you have a timeline. Um, down here along the side, um, you have basically uh, cylinder displacement, so your liters per cylinder uh, from smaller to larger. And then there's also some output, power output there as well. So you've got a lot of different things going on here. Um, again, it makes it pretty complicated. Some of the key takeaways um, from this is that uh, the tier four represents a significant reduction in NOxes, hydrocarbon, and particulate matter. Um, you probably can't see it here. I've got another slide that kind of uh, shows the scale of change. Um, but again, we're, we're measuring. Sometimes EPA measures NOx and uh, hydrocarbons put together. And with tier four, they like to split them apart. They just want some more granularity on the measurements. And I said they also measure CO, which isn't an issue for us, and in particulate matter. And the unit of measurement is grams per kilowatt hour. So how much mass per output of the engine over a period of time. Another key takeaway, uh, there is no tier four schedule right now for engines under 600 kilowatts, and that's about 800 horsepower. <clears throat> so these 
commercial, uh, uh, recreational engines, and it kind of carries down to even this section here, which is a pretty large per cylinder displacement. If you're below that 600 kilowatt um, threshold, you can stay at tier three. There hasn't been any legislation to change that. So in some ways, at least for Cummins in the area that I work, so a lot of our engines are protected there. But some of the bigger stuff is not, and we're having to move to tier four. And then again, the above 600 kilowatt will be phased in over the next two years. So here's kind of the scale, or kind of showing how much change has occurred. Um, so the title, it's just Marine Compression Ignition Engine Emission Limits for Category A, um, or A Category 1, and it's just a, you know, the way EPA um, calls it. So this is 1.2 to 2.4 liters per cylinder. Um, so this is going to kind of fall into those 12, 13, 15 liter inline six cylinder engines. Along here we have NOx plus hydrocarbon, again, grams per kilowatt hour, so from zero up to 12. <clears throat> Along the bottom we have particulate matter, again, in grams per kilowatt hour. So IMO, tier one, it was really only concerned about NOx, and that was at 9.8. When we moved to tier two, we dropped that down to about uh, 7.3, somewhere around there. And that was about a 27% reduction. On the particulate matter side, you know, go from 0.2 to 0.11, and that was a 45, excuse me, um, the IMO tier one, there wasn't a particulate matter, so the, the, the tier two kind of boxed that in here. So we had a 0.2 particulate matter. When we moved to tier three a couple years ago, the box shrank. So usually, you know, a lot of our engines were kind of running around this range, so a little bit below the NOx and hydrocarbon limit, a little bit below the PM limit, and then we had to shift over to this region. So that takes development, takes time, takes money, takes resources, and uh, it, it strains engineering departments and, and engine manufacturers. And that's why you saw some of those engines that were tier two disappear for tier three. They no longer existed. They couldn't meet emissions. There is a little bit of loophole here called banking and trading. Basically, if you're, let's say, operating here um, in tier two, you're producing engines that were under the limits, you got a credit for each engine that you um, sold. And it kind of built up those credits. So when you move to that next tier of emissions, you were able to use those credits. You're trading them in. So you had an engine that was here, and you started doing development and decided you could only get here, so you met your NOx and hydrocarbon but you couldn't meet your PM, you could use some of those credits and still sell that engine. So some of those engines are still hanging on a little bit. Um, a lot of companies will use those on the higher performance engines where they just can't quite meet the emissions. Um, but that's a little bit of a loophole. So that's tier three, that's blue box. Now tier four, it's a pretty significant change. So we, you know, we're looking at 20% you know, reductions in that kind of range. Tier four, again, it breaks it up. So this is your, your NOx limit, your hydrocarbon, and your PM moves here. In both of those cases, it's about a 60% reduction. It's significant. It's a lot. And really what that drives is you can't do that by the engine itself. You can't do it with fuel system, with timing, injection quality, things like that. you got to bring other systems onto the engine to help get you there, uh, namely after treatment. Um, so it brings us to you know, how emissions controlled. So we got, really we call it two ways within Cummins. We call it in-cylinder, um, and these things, oops, sorry, in-cylinder. So the things that help us get us to better emissions are fuel systems, so better fuel systems. We talked about going from mechanical systems to electronic, um, where you have timing control, uh, pressure control, things like that, pilot injection, you know, common rail fuel systems that we use today, that greatly improves the combustion efficiency within the cylinder and, and drops the emissions. You've got air systems, so improving those, so you look at turbocharging systems, more efficient turbochargers might be able to create more boost at a lower RPM, so, you know, waste gates, um, variable geometry turbochargers, um, some manufacturers use thrift superchargers, 
And then in some cases, um, with some of this new emissions, to get the systems to work right, you have to balance the airflows. We're actually putting throttle valves on a diesel engine. And that could be even a throttle valve on the intake and a throttle valve on the exhaust as well. So before diesel engines, no throttle valves. Now I might have two of them on there. Um, and then uh, power cylinder design. And this is just optimization of the combustion that occurs within the cylinder. Um, so you're talking about you know, valve configuration, combustion chamber design. So diesel engines, the combustion chamber now is, is, is embedded into the piston bowl here. Uh, it's specially shaped to create swirl and efficient combustion. And then elimination of dead space. Um, dead space is spaces within that cylinder where combustion just doesn't occur because it might be a very small space. A prime example of that is uh, the dead space here between your cylinder wall, uh, your first top compression ring, and the piston. That space is small. There's a lot of heat transfer there. So any fuel air mixture that gets in there, usually it's, it's too cold in there to support combustion becomes dead space. So anything that doesn't burn in there, we'll say you got fuel that doesn't burn, now you got hydrocarbon issues. So there's, there's designs where they're pushing this piston ring as far up the piston as they possibly can to limit that amount of dead space. Now there's some trade-offs there. Now that top ring gets hotter and you got to be able to cool it so they've had cooling channels here within the pistons, things like that. Another thing that's kind of quasi in cylinder is exhaust gas recirculation, EGR. Again, this has existed on automotive um, engines for a long period of time. Basically, that's just, you know, the exhaust gas is just recirculated back to the intake side, and it limits the combustion temperature, reducing those uh, nitrogen compounds. So this is kind of a, I don't know if it's hard to see, but so this would be um, uh, an exhaust manifold, actually intake manifold, but the EGR system, basically you have to cool that exhaust gas before it goes back into the intake. So a diesel engine coming straight out of the engine, you know, on a high performance engine, that's 1300 degrees. You gotta cool that way down. So you gotta add an extra cooler on the engine. Now you've got this, you know, instead of just a heat exchanger there, now you've got an EGR cooler there as well. And then you're putting engine coolant through that, so now your heat load on your engine has now increased. Now you've got to upsize your cooling system, bigger seawater pump, bigger size plumbing, all those type of things. So it's kind of additive, and it kind of adds on um, to what you have to do. So it's not just as simple as slapping on an EGR and, and going with it. And then the after treatment, and just like the word says, it's after the engine. Um, some of the things we're, we're using now, a diesel oxidation catalyst, so this is again just like the uh, catalyst in your vehicle, it takes care of hydrocarbons, it basically uh, has precious metals in it, has a, has a reaction there, burns that unburnt fuel as it passes through. Um, diesel particulate filter, so this is that filter, it's a very fine ceramic, it traps the soot within it and keeps it there until you do a regeneration cycle. On a regeneration cycle, you actually pump extra fuel into the engine. It heats up the exhaust and actually burns the soot out of that. Great system, except now you've got to add extra fuel into the system. What does that do to your fuel economy? Drops it. And then selective catalytic reduction, which is kind of the, the current solution right now. Um, it does a, a number of things. Um, it, it's basically, it uses a diesel exhaust fluid called DEF. Um, if you see over the road trucks now, they've got their fuel tank, a diesel tank, and then you'll see a smaller plastic tank next to it and it's got a blue cap on it. That's your DEF tank. That's where you put the urea fluid into it. And it causes a, re re um, a reaction within the exhaust system. Um, so here's kind of the, the system here you would see in an uh, industrial application. You'd still have a particulate filter, you know, because this comes from the engine, particulate filter and then into your decomposition reactor, you know, fancy name. So this is where the DEF, the urea, enters the system. And then it goes through the catalyst right here. Um, and that pretty much does all your after treatment. I mean, so as you can see, this isn't a small piece of equipment. Especially when you think about marine diesels, you know, you could have exhaust pipes come out of the engine this big. Now you can kind of see the scale there, how much bigger that is than just the exhaust pipe. So you're thinking of canisters this big around. I mean, this is, this is a big piece of equipment. And a lot of marine in installations, what's at a premium? Space, Space exactly. Where are you going to put this thing? 
um, it's, it's, it's going to be a problem. Um, so. It has to be located within close proximity, because this is all uncooled exhaust going through here. So the further you put it away, the cooler the exhaust is, the less efficient the system is. So the closer you can put it to the engine, the better. And again, this is all dry. It's not wet. So now you have this big, dry exhaust system within the engine space. Typically, that's not what we want, and especially on pleasure vessels. You want to have a wet system as soon as you can after the engine. So. There's going to be some packaging concerns there. So what are the impacts of emission regulations? Um, so performance, really we can achieve the same performance. That's really not too big of a deal. I mean, there's some cost implications, there's some extra development, things like that. But generally we can hit the same performance. Uh, the economy, this is where it kind of gets a little dicey. Generally the fuel consumption um, is increased a little typo there, increase to meet the next tier of emissions. Um, so we went from tier two to tier three emissions where we're at now, fuel economy actually dropped. So our emissions went down, so what EPA measures, you know, NOxes, hydrocarbons, PMs, but your fuel consumption went up, you're burning more fuel, you're actually producing more carbon dioxide. So it's a, it's a trade-off. And generally that's about three to five percent when we made that change. In some cases, we can do some efficiency improvements and, and stay kind of neutral, but there was an increase there. Um, the SCR systems, the selective catalytic reductions, they're more neutral, but you have to put that extra fluid in there. You have to use it. It's called that DEF fluid. So now, when they talk about fuel economy for these systems that use SCR, they look at the total cost. So they're adding the fuel cost plus the DEF fluid cost as well. And then we kind of got into the packaging. These components can be sizable. They're large. Um, and, and how do you implement those into a, a marine engine room? It's difficult to do. Um, questions on emissions? Yes, sir. What about scrubbers and or underwater exhaust? Is that any way to mitigate some of these uh, issues? Um, yeah, so uh, talked about scrubbers and underwater exhaust systems. So when the EPA measures exhaust, it's done in a very controlled test environment, and they're measuring what comes out of the exhaust system. So you have to meet that requirement. The scrubbers and underwater exhaust, so if you have a, a, a soot problem, something like that, so you're running a generator and you're getting soot built up on the hull, you could run it through a scrubber or underwater and kind of mitigate that soot coming out. It really doesn't do anything from an emission standpoint, but from a customer satisfaction cleanliness, um, it helps. EPA won't recognize that? No. It's what's coming directly out of the engine is what they measure. Okay. Um, so we'll move into um, interaction of power density, duty cycle, and durability. Um, marine diesels are rated based on our intended usage. Um, it's called duty cycle and expected durability. Uh, sometimes we call it time before overhaul. And then the reliability is also a factor. Um, warranty is kind of tied in the reliability. But when you rate a diesel engine, um, typically we dictate the duty cycle. So the duty cycle is a measure of how much power you're using out of that engine at any one given time. So um, if you're at cruise speed and your engine could produce 400 horsepower, but you're only using 300, that's a 75% duty cycle. So we look at that kind of over the whole range of engine operation, we'll come up with a, a number, a percentage. Um, then we also typically have rated speed and load limitations. So how much time can you spend at kind of wide open throttle, that rated speed point? Um, we have limits there. And then of course, uh, annual usage. So this is a comparison sample. Um, I just kind of pulled what Caterpillar has and what Cummins has. It worked out kind of well because we had the same number of ratings, so it uh, split pretty well. Something to understand about ratings and the way uh, manufacturers do them, there really isn't a wrong or right way, you know, better or worse on the way they do them. This is really for, for us engineers on how we design the product. How can, do we know we're meeting the customer expectations, their targets, their thresholds? You know, are we 
can the, can the customer use it in this way and will it last to their expectation? They're targets for us. So each manufacturer has a little bit of different variance on, on the way they do things. Um, like I said, these guidelines, you know, they, they're guidelines on how to apply each engine based on the design, um, testing validation, and warranty coverage. Because um, warranty is, is quite often tied in to these. So if you look at Caterpillar, you know, they do an alphabetical A, B, C, D, E. This is a, a continuous commercial duty rating. This is a recreational. Cummins, we use a, you know, a CD, continuous, heavy duty, medium continuous, intermittent, high output. And you can see they kind of pretty well line up. So here, you know, load factor 80 to 100%, us up to 100. Time at rated speed, 100%, 100%. Usage per, per year, five to 8,000 hours. Cummins, we say unlimited, but really, you know, you run 24-7, 365, it's about 9,000 hours. That's as many as you can get in a year. So unlimited really doesn't mean all that much. Uh, and then kind of going across here, they kind of line up fairly similar, similarly. Um, the recreational, the CAT, you know, the load factor up to 30%, time at rated speed, 8%, usage per year, 250, 1,000. Cummins, up to 30%, same time at rate at 12.5%, a little bit more, usage per year, 500. So, like I said, there is no wrong and right here. It's just a way to know that you can apply this engine and be comfortable that's going to meet expectations. Um, so this is just a little bit chart showing kind of durability, durability expectations and the kind of the way us engineers use that information. Um, so looking at this little chart here, so you got design limits, generic, uh, temperatures, pressures. Lots of times when we develop engines, we're looking at uh, turbine inlet temperature, so the temperature exhaust going into the turbocharger, peak cylinder pressures, uh, combustion phase temperatures. And a lot of those temperatures and pressures are driven from the material limits themselves. So put in perspective, so a cast iron exhaust manifold of good quality is going to be good up to about 1,350 degrees. Once you go that, past that point, it, 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 becomes, it starts to fail. It weakens and, and it, it'll fail. So these are the design limits here. So, you know, so increasing temperature, increasing pressure. And here's kind of the durability. These are the expectations. How long do we want it to last? And you look at this curve here. So we have, let's say, a design limit, arbitrary design limit. Um, so, like I say, that's, that's 1,350 degrees on an exhaust manifold. Once you go beyond that point, it drops off exponentially. You come back here and the life, you know, kind of increases, increases, increases. So when we do our rating development, our higher duty cycle product, these commercial products, you know, with the expectation of lasting a long time, our design limits are going to be way back here. It's going to be very conservative. When we do our design limits for our recreational, our high output products, we're going to put our design limit right on top of that material limit. So what does that mean? So on a commercial product, you've got some room to kind of abuse that product. I mean, you can run it harder than what we say you can, and it's still going to last a pretty good long time. Maybe not as long as you want it to, but it's still going to last. On this recreational product, if you abuse it, if you overload it, you're already at the material limits. Once you step over that line, your durability drops off precipitously. You know, and that's, that's the big problem within um, the recreational market with our engines, is to make sure that the installation's right. So you've got good fuel, cool fuel, got good air into the uh, engine room. The propping is correct. The engine is loaded correctly. Because that is it's going to match up then with how we tested the engine and developed it. You step over that line, you know, all bets are off. So another chart, just kind of looking at the variabilities affecting durability. Um, and I kind of spaced them out here. So on here, it's, it's, it's more controlled, and here it's, it's uncontrolled. Uh, you can see end user, the operator here is the uncontrolled part of it. So from the controlled standpoint, kind of you start off with, What's the boat going to be used for? And that's pretty well defined. You know, a fisherman's going to say, I'm going to be dragging nets. You know, I'm going to be doing it for this amount of time at this speed. You know kind of how the engine is going to be used. And so you can, based on this chart, you can kind of select an engine. 
no problem. Right, you, and that kind of feeds into this uh, rating to application match. So you, you can kind of get an idea of where that engine is going to fall. Um, it's a little less controlled than understanding what the boats are going to actually be used for, because lots of times, you know, engine manufacturer might produce a, a 400 horsepower engine, but customer really wants 425. So what happens? Well, maybe it's not continuous. Maybe we'll use a heavy duty or a medium continuous and we'll put in application. So that's when things start to go wrong, a little bit less controlled. Kind of in the middle here is, is propulsion load match. So this is your propping. So this is usually done at the, the OEM, the vessel manufacturer. Sometimes they do a good job, sometimes they don't. Usually the big watch out here is when they build the boat and they test it. You know, it doesn't have the cabinets in it. It's not full of fuel, not full of water. It doesn't have any beer or ice on it. The boat's light and they prop it out to get the maximum amount of speed, and once the customer puts all the fuel and everything else on it, now you're overloaded. You know, and that's kind of the uncontrolled portion of it. Kind of in the middle again is, is maintenance. Us as manufacturers, we can tell the customer all day long how to do maintenance and what to do, and we could document it, so that's the control part of it. Whether they do it or not, we can't really do anything. I and mean, we can kind of hold warranty over the head, things like that, but it's, it's somewhat uncool. And then, and then we move on to the really uncontrolled parts so of hull fouling. You know, it's just going to happen. You've got to deal with it. Storage and non-use, so customer only uses a couple weeks out of the year and it sits for the rest of the time. We all know that's not good for a boat and not using it. And then, of course, at the end, the, the end user, um, they're the most uncontrolled part of it. You really can't do anything about them. So really, you ask the question, you know, once the boat is in service, what can we do to influence the durability? And really, it comes down to the stuff in the middle, making sure the propping's right, and then making sure you're doing the maintenance. You do those two things, pretty much going to have a, a good running engine for a long period of time. Do a time check here. I got a couple minutes. And uh, propulsor load match. So uh, this is a performance curve and data sheet that we publish at Cummins, and other manufacturers do similar sheets. Basically, just details the engine, the output of the engine, things like that. Um, so this example, QSB 6.7, 550 horsepower at 3,300 RPM. Um, so you have here power, horsepower along this axis, speed along this axis. This curve, top here curve, that's the maximum output of the engine. 100% load across the whole speed range. This curve here, this nice smooth curve here, that's the theoretical prop curve. For recreational product, we use a 2.7 exponent to create this curve. On a commercial, it's a 3.0. It's a little deeper curve here, kind of comes up a little swifter towards the end. Except it's theoretical, it's not actual. You know, actual, you have this bump here, especially on planing holes, and then you smooth out and then you come up here. But it gives you kind of a baseline. Um, to work from. The real important point is up here, the propping point. Um, so engine, man engine manufacturers, we tell you if it runs at 3,300 RPM, we want you to prop it so it le uh, gets to at least 3,300 RPM. We actually want you to get a little bit above that uh, for some margin. So on this engine, rated 3,300, governor set point is, uh, I believe, 75 RPM above that. So these engines now, electronic governor, you get the 3375, that engine's just going to stop. It's not going to go any further. It's not like the old mechanical engines, mechanical governors, where they kind of came way out here, like 150, 175 RPM over. You're just going to stop. Um, and you'll get the 100% load. As you can see here, it's kind of constant power in that range, so you're not going to lose power by propping out to that point. Uh, lots of times with new boats, since the boat is light, you're actually propping on this line here. So you'll get to the governor, the engine will stop, but you'll look at your load display and you'll actually be at something less than 100%. That's actually desirable, because as you increase weight of that boat, that curve is going to, that point's going to come up here and it's going to eventually start sliding back past that governor set point towards that 100% load. So again, you heard the terms, you know, overpropped. You know, that's when you're down here in this region, under propped or over on this region. And then the propping variables, you know, as we all know, 
It's the prop itself. Does it have the right one on there? A fouling of the hull, you know, adds resistance to the hull. You're also carrying all the weight of those organisms and all the water that's entrained with it. Um, the weight of the boat, the trim of the boat has a big effect. Um, so boat, some boats need to have trim tabs, you know, that set at a certain position to make sure you're going to hit that rated speed. So if the customer is not using the tabs correctly, you're going to overload the engine. And then ambient conditions, you know, the current, you know, wave conditions, temperature, the hotter the temperature, the less output you have. And then also the maintenance on the, on the boat itself, fuel restrictions and things like that. So I'm kind of at that natural stopping point. That's why I thought I would get to, and I'm pretty much on time. Um, any questions on that material? Uh, engines running slow and getting overloaded and having to burn them out clean and such? Yes. Um, they are certainly a lot cleaner at those idle conditions. I mean, the modern electronic and controlled engines, you can run them at those light loads for a very, very long period of time. Periodically, you do want to bring them up, but it's not like the old mechanical fuel systems. Because back then, you had, you had soot buildup. You had fuel slobber, things like that you were concerned about. And, and really... A lot of those things were driven from the truck markets, um, heavy duty trucks where people would go in, in sleeper cabs and they'd leave the engine running so they have air conditioning. We never had that much of a problem with marine boats, kind of a carryover, but certainly, you know, the soot accumulation, buildup within the cylinders, things like that, that's certainly less of an issue with the uh, electronic engines we have today. Yes. So uh, the question is, what is the uh, pressure of the fuel within the common rail? Um, so it's extremely high. Uh, most systems run at least 1,600 bar. So thinking about 20,000 psi systems now, we're working on 2,000 bar, so 25,000 psi. So extremely high pressures within those systems. Um, but that's where you get the injection quality. When that fuel comes out of the injector, it's atomized extremely, extremely fine. You get more surface area in the fuel for the oxygen to attach, and you get better combustion. You complete that fire triangle. Uh, that's really where the efficiency gains are with those systems. Yes? Um, loud. Here's come the microphone. Are you engine manufacturers interacting with the insurance companies these days with an understanding that with these high pressure fuel injection systems into your engines when a failure occurs and a massive fire occurs in a lot of these boats that have fractured lines or connections. Is there some, something on the horizon that we're going to see in, in the way of insurance companies mandating how we have to deal with this because we've got so um, much high pressure? So the kind of connection we have with insurance companies is if you have a classed application and they're requiring some additional safety on that fuel system to get that unit certification to be able to get insurance. So in those cases, instead of a single wall line, you're doing a dual skin fuel line. So you have an inner line, which handles the pressure, an outer line. So if you do have a leak, it contains it, brings it to a drain tank, and then you have an alarm on it to let you know you have an issue. In those cases, you may also shield the rail as well. So that's an added level of safety. To be honest, the, the fuel systems on there, it's very, very rare we get a leak on them. I mean, they're extremely robust. We do engineering uh, called failure mode and effects analysis. We kind of go through all these different failure modes. And it's one of the things we look at is leaks. Another thing, not related to the fuel system, to help mitigate the risk of fire, though, is we follow a lot of the SOLAS uh, regulations. So we like to limit the amount of hot surfaces on the engine. So like exposed exhaust surfaces. So um, if it's a wet manifold, we try to limit the amount that's not cooled by the coolant. If it's a dry manifold, we like to have nice robust shields on there that are leak tight, make sure that you know, flammable fluids, whether it's fuel, oil, or coolant, can drip onto it. Um, so there's things that we do do to help kind of mitigate those risks. Thank you. What, kind, what kind of um, 
what kind of heat are you seeing in the catalytic converters, and what are you doing to mitigate that heat? And also for the the regen, I'm curious of how that works around maneuvering around the dock. Say the boat regens around the dock, and you lose power or some of the output. Yeah. So the temperatures. I mean, it's really not within the catalyst itself. I'm really not sure, but you know, exhaust temperatures can range up to about 1,300 degrees. Out of the engine, out of the turbo, when you go into the after treatment, you're looking about eight to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so if you have those systems, obviously you're going to have to shield them or insulate them, um, not to have all those hot surfaces for touchable hazards, you know, safety of people. And then also you don't want fuel and flammable liquids impinging on that and causing fires. So that's one of those, you know, integration issues you have with putting these systems on vessels is, is how do you protect them? Um, from people and, and, and from flammable liquids. Um, and then the other part of the question was, regen. sorry, oh, regen. Um, so regen, it, it kind of happens seamlessly. Um, I really don't know of many that are on marine applications. It was something that was kind of used in uh, over the road trucks. I know like the Dodge pickup and the Ford Power Stroke, um, they had some issues with the calibration and would go into the regen cycle. So basically, you're dumping a bunch of excess fuel into the exhaust system. You'd actually have flames shooting out the exhaust, and a little bit, a little bit too much fuel. Um, but basically, it's it's the engine manages it, so it wouldn't be you know affecting performance or anything at all. That would be something that's tuned um, and accounted for. Ian, right here, we have one more question from Bob. Yeah, you you mentioned. Uh, um, TBO and warranty, we've discussed warranty mm -hmm. and factory required maintenance schedules and that. Do you see any kind of a shift where we're going to go to now with the better monitoring of the modern engines where we're going to move to um, gallons run through the engine versus time period? Um, we do a little bit of that on the larger commercial stuff. We actually have some tools you can use to kind of gauge, you know, the durability engine based on the fuel that you, you use. Um, we have those predictors on the smaller stuff. We don't really have that quite yet. Um, but as far as, you know, predictive maintenance, I think is what you're asking about. So, you know, instead of changing my oil every 150, 200 hours, it's based on how I'm running the boat, you know, how much of that oil life are you using. Um, we don't have that yet. I know the military asked for that, and it's, it's probably something that will come, that predictive maintenance um, monitoring within the system. Mm -hmm. If I good, can. This is good stuff, so Bob, you have another follow-up? It's a little bit on a different line, and I was wondering, I, we see some of the commercial application or military applications going to alternate fuel, LPG or CNG. Do we see that in the recreational on the horizon? Um, we definitely see moving to uh, liquefied natural gas, things like that in the future. We have engines that run on liquefied natural gas now, more on an industrial side, some automotive. For us now, the al alternate fuels we're working with now are the light distillates, uh, the jet fuels that the military use, JP8, JP5. That's really our focus right now. One more. Somebody had their hand up back there on the Jeep above you. That's it? Great. That's terrific. Thanks, Jim. Great stuff. Thank, Thank you. you.